I spent my childhood in Florida. My 82-year-old mother lives there to this day. We often saw a translucent young man walking across the front window and through the yard. Lamps and radios turned themselves on and off all hours of the night. The worst growing up was the heavy boot steps that were up and down the long back hallway of the house leading to the addition that held my bedroom. My parents were far too poor to consider moving five kids to another house. So their solution was to always be really frank and calm about what was happening and that it couldn't hurt us. The one terrifying memory I have is one night when I was eight years old. I laid awake for hours most nights, listening to the ghost sound that would approach my door and then pace back down the hall. This night, for whatever reason, I got really frustrated and yelled. The steps stopped at my door. It opened slightly. I still remember the feeling of the fabric being pulled against my cheek. Crying and screaming ensued, and my parents ran in to calm me. I have so many stories. I lived in a very active haunted house from the age of 6 to 22. You couldn't go more than a few days without seeing someone who wasn't there on the steps or in the window reflections. Seeing things moving, hearing someone run the hallway in steps, hearing voices calling your name when home alone, or hearing voices in another room, only to open the door and find the room empty. I saw the first apparition when I was six. A woman in white followed my mom into her bedroom. The last experience I had was the night before we moved out. Activity had been high all week, but that last night I saw the man on the steps. I smiled at him and said, I'll miss you guys, as I walked up the steps. I could fill pages with what myself, my family, and my friends experienced in that house. I still miss it sometimes. I can't forget them. I grew up in a haunted house in Florida, but it wasn't pretty mild. We would see what looked like human-shaped smoke clouds, especially in my room, the living room, and the kitchen. There were also times I'd see a beard man looking at me through my doorway, and I would think my dad was home when he wasn't there. On two occasions, I was sitting on the floor and felt hands holding my legs down. The most memorable incident, however, was when I was trying to pour myself a cup of water, and something kept pushing the cup away when I tried. I told it to stop, and it pushed the cup toward me, and that was the end of it. My husband and I used to live in a 100-year-old hand-built craftsman home in Florida. Anytime we would change something, paint, hang pictures, and etc., we'd hear footsteps, door slamming, and glass breaking, and find our things moved around. Neither one of us ever felt alone in the house either. However, it never felt scary or dangerous until we started having marital problems. After an incident, I asked my husband to leave and he went to stay with his parents for a few days. It was really looking like we were headed for divorce. One day, we were standing in the kitchen, talking before he was going to leave, and the back door slammed. We heard heavy footsteps running up and down the basement stairs, followed by a bunch of crashing noises. It was the first time that they felt true terror being in that house. We checked the basement, and there was no one there, but we could hear the noises continuing upstairs. I burst into tears and told him I didn't feel safe staying in the house alone. He said he would stay over and sleep in the guest room. We ended up going to counseling and working things out. The darn ghost saved my marriage. After my grandparents had passed, my six-year-old son and I moved into their house in Florida. On our first night staying in the house, I was walking down the stairs, and my son was waiting at the bottom. He looked up at me and asked, Oh, who's that guy behind you? I whipped around and didn't see anything. I asked what he meant, stirred for a few seconds, then said, Never mind. As soon as he said guy, I knew who he was talking about. I had an uncle who was 16 when I was born. When I was about a year old, he shot himself here and passed. He had friends with him at the time, and 
they said he was playing Russian roulette. One of the wildest coincidences is that my son and my deceased uncle shared the same birthday. Our kitchen door opens on occasion, but other than that, my uncle has been fairly quiet the last several years. I lived in a typical haunted house as a young woman. All the usual bumps in the night, footsteps on the stairs, doors and cabinets opening seemingly on their own. I just kinda got too used to it. One day, I was standing at my kitchen sink and looked over my left shoulder to see what I can only describe as a glitch in the matrix. I saw my living room, but it wasn't how I knew it. People were milling about the fireplace as if a party was going on. Someone went to send down a cup of mantle and missed the edge. Just as the cup came crashing down to the floor, the scene changed back to my modern day living room setup. It was bizarre, to say the least, and still after over 20 years, I have difficulty truly explaining exactly what I saw for a moment in the time. I currently live in a haunted house and really, it's great. Our ghost, who we have several names for, he's just lonely. Someone did die in our house 20 years ago, and he never seemed to leave. He's pretty inactive spring through early fall and makes himself known again by slamming our bedroom door. He moves specific figures around the TV room. He also likes messing with the blinds, but when he's feeling salty and moody, that's when he messes with the doors. So I talk out loud, and he settles down. It's never felt evil. I just think he's not ready to move on just yet. So we are not forcing him to. One cat really locks him to. So we have a chill ghost. I have always told him that when he's ready to move on, move the fan pin on my shelf. And I make it happen. <laughs> Me and my friends were driving home from a show we all went to. This was about seven years ago, in the Cerritos area, there's an elementary school. We drove by there, all of us joking and laughing or whatever 16 years old do, and one of my friends looked over at the playground in the school, screamed, and refused to talk to anyone for a few hours. We all asked her what was wrong, what she saw, what happened, but nothing would make her tell us. We all thought she saw someone on the playground or a dead body or something. All we knew was that she was seriously spooked. As backstory, I should add that she is really sensitive to paranormal happenings. I should also add this, I don't really believe in ghosts. She would have doors fly open at her old house, clothes hangers fly off the rail, cops fall over and then ride themselves multiple times. She eventually told her boyfriend what she had seen. She said that she had briefly seen a bunch of blood-covered people walking around the playground aimlessly. I immediately started blaming exhaustion, as it was around 2 a.m. when we drove by. We looked it up later, and it turns out that a plane had crashed into the school, and lots of people have died there. Kids spoke music. I couldn't believe that. I was about 14, and creepy stuff had been happening in my room. Started with my TV turning off, and not at random times of the night. When I would wake up, there would be dirty handprints around the edge of my ceiling, like something was pawing to get out. Then the shadows just moving back. Then the real stuff hit the fan. One night tapping on the walls and scratching in the ceiling scared the shit out of me, but they still said nothing to my dad. Then it happened and I couldn't tell anyone. I was just sitting there watching TV in my room and in the creepiest voice I've ever had. How are you today? Like an old lady. Packed my things up and ran the fastest I ever ran down my stairs in my life. My brother was downstairs, doing whatever when I basically folded down the stairs, physically shaking with him, asking what happened and why he was so freaked out. I told my dad about it told us to go see a movie while he worked his magic on my room. Everything was fine for many years, until I just heard some taps on my wall a few days ago. I don't know how can I fix it. A few years ago, I went to a Christmas party. The night my housemates went home earlier while I decided to stay and get in the Christmas spirit with a few other friends. I ended up getting pretty hammered and got home around 2 a.m. Instead of going straight to bed, I got beer inside, then went down the back porch to have a smoke and look at the stars. I was outside a couple of minutes when I see the light go on in the kitchen. My housemate comes out and look at me out the back. I wave, look like a drunk idiot. I thought he was going to come out 
and get the debrief on the rest of the evening. He just gets the glass of water and goes to bed. I finish my smoke and beer and so do I. The next morning we are rehashing the previous night when he mentions getting up and seeing me having smoke out the back. Who came back from the party with you last night? No one bro, I was out there alone. He said, no man, there was someone out there with you, behind you on the porch, when you were looking inside waving. I didn't come out cause I thought it was some random friend from the Christmas party, couldn't be bothered making introductions. He stands by this version of events, must have been standing close behind me the whole time. I saw no one and heard nothing, make me horrified when I think about it. After I was born, my dad's best friend, Jim, have died. They were really close, and one of the last things he wanted was to hold me before he passed. His wish was felt, and after a short time, he was gone. Fast forward 7 years. I'm now 7 years old, with a 5 years old brother and recently born sister. One day the phone rings, and with my mom out and my dad in the washroom, I thought it was going to be ignored as we kids were still too young to answer the phone. But my brother broke the rule and answered. Hello? At this point, my dad is out of the washroom and is asking my brother to hand him the phone. Before my dad could ask a second time, my brother hangs up, looks at him and says, Jim says hi, and he misses you, then goes back to playing. The look of shock my dad had is what I remember the most about it. I cannot believe this. One of my brothers worked security in one of the town's most upscale hotels. The security desk received a friendly call during one of the night shift. A guy was calling. All freaked out that his wife was in the bath and wasn't breathing. My brother and security guard rushed upstairs. Sure enough, they found a woman in the tub and she was unresponsive. Got her out of the tub and attempted CPR. During resuscitation, the NYPD arrived. They told my brother to stop CPR. The husband was questioned extensively. He and his wife had a fight earlier. He went out on his own, and when he came back, his wife was in the bath, but later became concerned when his wife didn't come to bed. Among all those present, the general consensus was that the husband had something to do with. The room was again made available to guests. A woman who frequently stayed at the hotel made a reservation for a week and was assigned to that room. She was the first person to stay in this room since the incident. She came to the front desk very upset and with all of her luggage in tow. She said that she was cancelling the rest of her reservation and she would never be staying in this hotel. She couldn't sleep in the entire night. No one at the hotel had mentioned to her what had previously transpired in the room. My grandfather died last year when my son was baby. We had dinner with the whole family every Friday night. So my son had seen him several times. My grandfather was a very quiet, proud man, but whenever he was alone or unseen, he would make silly faces at my son to get a laugh. A couple nights after his funeral, my son, who liked to crawl into bed with us in the night, started just laughing uncontrollably at like 2 a.m. So I get out of bed to see what's going on and find my son sitting in the middle of the living room in the dark and laughing. I say, hey buddy, what are you doing? He says, papa funny. I got nervous for some reason and bring him to our room for the rest of the night. And as I'm holding him away, he says, bye papa, and a kiss at absolutely nothing I can say. I don't know how can I control this situation. It was near Halloween time when my friends and I were telling stories. My friend said she was going to tell a story about her parents' first date. She said she didn't like the story since it was actually true. To cut to the chase, the parents had spent the night, if it were the first date and around the time that they would have said goodnight. The male in the situation, my friend's dad, suggested that they go for a midnight hike up Provo Canyon, since he had done a fair amount of rock climbing in the area. So the two drove up the mouth of the canyon, go out of their cars and started hiking under just the light of the stars, since it was a new moon. At some point, the male starts getting a bad feeling, since the pathway ahead which would pass under some trees, would be dark, because it was getting to be quite late. He ignores the feeling and presses on. In later rehearsing of the story, the female would say that she had felt the same feeling at what was probably the same time, though she didn't know the trail as he did. A minute later, the feeling came back to the male. He ignored it again and started walking a bit of the way into the trees, when his foot hit something soft in the middle of the path. Under trees, it was too dark to see what this soft thing was and the feeling came back stronger than ever. 
instead of finding out what his foot had bumped into, he and the female both agreed to hightail it out of there. Years later, after being married for some time, they were watching an interview in response to a question asking him to describe the time that he felt the closest to being caught. He explained about the night he lured the girl into Provo Canyon and had just killed her when he heard some people coming up the trail, only to watch some guy walk right into the body and for some reason just walk away. Not from me. But I remember a story a high school teacher told me which always stuck with me. My former teacher was home alone when she was a child. A man knocked on her door and she opened her main door but kept her screen door locked. He said he was from the gas company and wanted to talk to her parents. She told him they weren't home and he, without missing a bit, tried to start forcing his way into the home. When he found the screen door to be locked, he pulled out the box cutter and started to cut through the screen. My teacher ran to hide in the clothes chamber in her parents' closet. My teacher said she sat here for about 10 minutes before the police arrived. Thank God a neighbor saw everything and called the police or she probably would be dead. Also to put the cherry on the freaking creepy Sunday, they found the intruder hiding in the attic. She told us that as a cautionary tale to lock all doors and windows when home alone. Of course, I would go home from school to be alone for hours. My daughter woke me up around 11 last night. My wife and I had picked her up from her friend's birthday, brought her home and put her to bed. My wife went into bedroom to read while I fall asleep. Daddy, she whispered, tugging my shirt sleeve. Guess how old I'm going to be next month? I don't know, beauty. I said as I slipped on my glasses. How old? She smiled and held up four fingers. It's seven now. My wife and I had been up with her for almost eight hours. She still refuses to tell us where she got them. It is really strange, isn't it? I was 17 and a foster kid. The family I stayed with had this old typical San Francisco style two-story house with wood floors. One night, I went to the bathroom that was right in front of the stairs on the first floor. As I was about to walk back upstairs, I saw the bottom of a lady's long white gown at the top of the stairs. I thought it was the foster mom or sister and asked if they wanted me to leave the light on in the bathroom. The gown just turned and went down the hallway. I thought it must have been my foster sister because she was little, like 10 or 11, and did that sometimes. I went upstairs and peeked in the parents' room. They were snoring. I went back to our room where my sister was dead asleep in her bed, wearing a t-shirt. I was freaked out and quickly closed our door as I suddenly realized that there was no sound of footsteps walking on the wood floor. I hopped in bed and hide under my blanket for the rest of the night. As a kid, I grew up on a street that was newly developed. There was a vacant lot across the road and led down a hill to a river. I had a recurring nightmare that me and my brothers were in the lot picking up rubbish. I'd get to the river bank, look in the water, and a red demon would drag me into the water to drown. I'd wake up terrified. This happened a lot when I was a kid, and as I got older, the dream stopped, and I didn't really mention it to anyone. Fast forward many years later, and my five-year-old daughter wakes up crying from a bad dream. I comfort her and ask her if she wants to tell me what the dream was about. She tells me, I was in a field picking flowers, and I got too close to the river, and a red devil dragged me in. I didn't know what to say. It sounded just like my dream. She has had the same dream a few times since as well. I was coming home from work one night. I was too tired, so I got home and went right to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to my roommate knocking on my bedroom door, telling me that someone was trying to open our back door. I woke up and let her into my room, and we peeked outside together from my bedroom window, where we could see police lined up with their lights on in the front of the house. We called 911 to see if the dispatcher would tell us what was going on. She let me know that a man had attacked a woman with a machete. He was running from the cops through backyards, and he was probably in ours now. We then saw a bunch of cops with their guns drawn, and a canine officer walked down our driveway, kicked down our fence, and released the dog, catching this man and arresting him in our backyard. The creepiest part happened the next morning. We went to look at the damage to the fence, and saw a bloody handprint on our white back door. I'll never forget it.
My mom used to call my grandma every single night. However, during a family camping trip when I was 15, she was unable to call her because the cell phone reception was horrible. So my dad promised we could go to the nearest town for breakfast in the morning so that she could get service and call grandma. But when we got to the town, mom had over missed calls and voicemails. Most of them were from my cousin who lived across the country. She would always talk about having visions, but my parents and I thought she was full of it. My mom listened to the messages, and my cousin was crying and saying someone was hurting my grandma at the exact moment. She kept asking for my mom to call or go to her, because she was being stabbed. My cousin described fire and being suspended in the air. The remaining voicemails from other family members trying to tell mom that grandma had been murdered. Someone had broken in, stabbed her, tied her up, and then lit the house on fire. It was bad enough that my mom blamed herself, because it happened during their usual phone call time. But the intense mix of visions is why we don't really talk about my grandmother's death. When my great uncle was alive, I saw him once a year and didn't have a really warm relationship with him. Ten-year-old me thought of him being old, a bit peculiar, but kind. The day he passed away, my parents went to his house to clean up before they sold the place. I inherited the piano. I always wanted to have a piano in my bedroom. So I was filled with joy when I got it. One day, I was alone in my room practicing the note, when suddenly the piano took over. I had mastered only the intro, but the piano went on with the parts I didn't know. You couldn't see the keys being pressed, but you could hear it. I called my sister and a friend, and they turned pale. After a while, it stopped by itself, like nothing had ever happened. So weird. After several times, I cannot believe it. I used to have dreams all the times. They were moments that would end up happening, like I experienced them in the dream. One night, I had the most vivid dream about a car accident. So vivid, I thought I must have seen it on TV while I was falling asleep, but I realized that wasn't possible because I had gone from seeing the accident from the outside of the truck to suddenly being inside, viewing from what would have been the back seat if the car had won. I saw the truck flip over and both passengers hit their heads, killing them. It really bothered me, because it seemed more real than other dreams. I couldn't shake it. I talked about it a few people, and carried on wondering what prompted it in the first place. Several weeks later, I arrived at the sense of an identical accident. Same truck flipped over, in the exact same spot as my dream. Having the left lane of the highway, and half on the grassy median, every detail was the exact same, and it horrified me. After several times, I cannot believe it. I've been a nurse for over 20 years. I've had plenty of weird creepy experiences, but this one chills me. I had two older patients that I was taking care of, one in 304 and one in 305. If there wasn't a wall between their rooms, their headboards would have been butted up to each other. The gentleman in 305 was completely non-verbal. He didn't talk, he didn't respond. His pupils were fixed and staring. He was physically alive, but mentally not there at all. My patient in 304 was basically there to die, but she was completely alert. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, she took a turn for the worse. She was struggling to breathe, panicking, begging for help, but Adam and that we don't do anything to save her from dying. I turned up her oxygen, called the doctor to get orders, then started doing what the doctor ordered to try to get her comfortable again. While I was administering meds, my nurse tech came to the beside next to me. In a horrible voice, she said, you have got to go to see room 305. I had another nurse stay with my patient in 304, and he did to 305. I heard him before I even walked in. He was singing in a loud, beautiful tenor, singing about meeting God at the pearly gates and going home. I slowly walked into the room and said his name. No response. He kept singing. I grabbed his leg. No response. Still singing. I shook his arm, but he didn't respond to me at all. He was just laying in my bed staring out at nothing and singing about going home to even. I stood and listened for a few seconds, but I eventually went back to my dying patient. After about 25 minutes, she took her last breath. I set about doing all the things I needed to do after her death, but remembered my patient in 305. I went to his doorway and all I heard was silence. I peeked my head in and looked at him. He was laying there as usual, 
staring out at nothing, completely silent. Once my other patient passed, he stopped singing, and I never heard him make another sound the rest of the time I cared for him. I found the whole situation kinda beautiful, but it still freaks me out. This took place during the time of the war. Our house didn't have air conditioning, so we kept our windows open. One night, I heard the dog bark and then what sounded like a bottle hitting the ground. After that, she stopped barking. I went to get ready for bed and I felt like someone was trying to look at me through the blinds that they had closed. I went to bed anyways and drifted off to sleep. Suddenly, I was being overtaken by mosquitoes. I yelled out to my father, confused, as to why there were so many mosquitoes in my room. I sat up in bed and turned on the light to find that the window at the foot of my bed had been opened as wide as it could. The blinds were pulled completely up and the screen had been removed that had been done to several windows in the house. Soon after, my dad fenced in the backyard and installed central air conditioning. That was so weird, wasn't it? I was on a road trip and heard a voice in my head say clearly, accident in Oakville. I don't know what it was, but it was on edge and drove extra carefully. I pulled up to a red light and left extra space in front of me due to this warning. Suddenly, there was a loud sound, things in the car went flying, followed by another loud sound. A vehicle traveling at full speed had hit me from behind and pushed my car underneath the cute van in front of me. The extra space I left in front of me as a caution saved my life. My car was repaired and it survived the crash. I had a friend who died less than a year prior to this accident. And there is no one in the world who can convince that it wasn't them who protected me that day. Sometimes you hear some things that you cannot believe in, but they are real and they can easily change your life. On Monday, I came up with the perfect plan. No one even knew we were friends. On Tuesday, he stole a gun from his dad. On Thursday, while the entire school was in the gym, we waited just outside the doors. I was to use the gun on whoever walked out first. Then he would take the gun and go into the gym blasting. I walked up to Mr. Queen, the guidance counselor, and shot him in the face two times. He fell back into the gym. Dead. The shots were deafening. We heard screams in the auditorium one could not see us yet. I handed him the gun and whispered, Your turn. He ran into the gym and started firing. I followed the moment after. He hadn't hit anyone yet. Kids were scrambling and hiding. It was mayhem. I ran up behind him and tackled him. We struggled. I wrenched the gun out of his hands, turned it on him, and killed him. I closed his mouth forever. On Friday, I was anointed a hero. It was indeed the perfect plan. It was 1 a.m. and Guy Helverson sat in his dark living room. He hadn't moved for over an hour. The accident earlier that evening kept playing over and over in his mind. The light turned red, but he was in a hurry and accelerated. An orange blur came from his right, and in a split second there was a violet jolt. Then the bicyclist rolled across his hood and fell out of sight. Horns bled angrily, and he panicked, stepping on the gas and screeching away from the chaos into the darkness shaken and keeping an eye on his rear view mirror. Why did you run? You idiot! He'd never committed a crime before this and punished himself by imagining years in jail, his career gone, his family gone, his future gone. Why not just go to the police right now? He can afford a lawyer. Then someone tapped on the front door and his world suddenly crumbled away beneath him. They found me. There was nothing he could do but answer it. Running would only make matters worse his body trembling. He got up, went to the door, and opened it. A police officer stood on the porch light. Mr. Helverson asked the grim officer. He let out a defeated sigh. Um, yes, let me, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I have some bad news. Your son's bike was struck by a hit and run driver. He died at the scene. I'm very sorry for your loss. Sign here, please. The doctor hung the device around his neck. Mr. Weatherby, all of your tests has come back negative, and my examination shows nothing abnormal. Adam knew what was coming next. I'm not crazy, doctor. 
I'm sorry, but there is no physical reason for why you lose control of your hand. A psychologist can help you. I don't need therapy. I need answers. They seem to have a life all their own. I can't hold a job. I'm under investigation for assault. I almost killed my neighbor. I'll try anything at this point. After two weeks on a new medication, Adam saw no progress and grew increasingly depressed. He was convinced that despite what the doctor said, it was not a psychological problem. That night, a frustrated and angry Adam sat in a chair and drank bourbon, drunk and hopeless. He stumbled to the garage and started at the table saw, then slowly lowered his wrists toward the screaming blade. Detective Armstrong entered the garage, where uniformed officers stood over the blood-soaked body. So, what do we get? He asked. Taking in the blood splattered scene, this is a weird one. Detective. How so? Take a look at the body. He apparently chopped off his hands with the table saw and bled to death. Armstrong knelt. And? And we can't find his hands anywhere. I don't know why I looked up, but when I did, I saw him there. He stood against my window, his forehead rested against the glass, and his eyes were still in light, and he smiled a lipstick red, cartoonish green, and he just stood there in the window. My wife was upstairs, sleeping. My son was in his crib, and I couldn't move. I froze, and watched him looking past me through the glass. No, please no. His smile never moved, but he put a hand up and slid it down the glass, watching me with matted hair and a yellow skin through the window. I couldn't do anything. I just stayed there, frozen, feet still in the bushes I was pruning, looking into my home. He stood against my window. This is what I do every night. He's my guest. People started falling from the sky by the close of the decade. They were never dressed, always naked always a petrifying grin on their faces. It had been just a few at first, but then hundreds and thousands would fall at the time, destroying cars and homes, and blocking off highways. Strange discoveries were made upon research. They were human, but lacked any blood or even a heart. No one could explain the hideous grins they had, or even where they came from. It was a woman, who made the latest and most disturbing discovery. She recognized one of the fallen bodies as a long dead relative. When who died back when she was a teenager, then more and more identifications were made. Soon people were picking out their long, dead loved ones amongst the video feeds. No one could explain why they were coming back, falling from the sky. Even more distressing, after disposing of the bodies, it wouldn't be long until the same body came plummeting from the sky again and again. You couldn't get rid of them, no matter what. People were getting killed by the higher volume of the falling bodies, and soon after burial, they too began to fall. My mother was killed when a body landed on her car, crushing her. The next week, the news reported on a body that had gotten lodged in an airplane windshield. I saw my mother's grinning face, the happiest I'd ever seen her. They say when hell is full of people, the dead shall walk the earth. Where are you? I screamed, panicked. I ran through the abandoned farm. I can't find her. Not in the old house. Not in the bar. My heart racing. As I scan the area, I run into a mound of dirt and trip, sprawling to the ground, getting up. It hits me. Abandoned farm. I tripped over freshly tilled earth, crouching down. I start frantically cloning with my hands, scooping handfuls of dirt. I hit something hard. It was wood. Are you in there? I cry pressing my ear to the wood. I hear muffled cries. I start digging again, but realize it's taking too long. Looking ground, I see a garden shed. I sprint to it, ripping the door open. I see a shovel, still caked in dirt, probably the same one that bastard buried her with. I grabbed it, running back. I started digging with purpose. Soon the wooden box is exposed. I toss the shovel and trip open the crate. She stares back at me, eyes wide. Bound, gagged, but alive. I sigh with relief. Thank God. I reach into my bag, pulling out my rag and chloroform. I crouch down, placing it over her face. She struggles and faints. 
I toss her over my shoulder. Hell, my brother says as I walk back to the truck with a smirk. You found her. Yep, he almost hit me though. All right, my turn. Where did you put her? I gesture to the creek area. Mm, somewhere over there. Drownings and Ishido. Jerk, he says, running off. I smile, watching him go. I love adult hide and seek. Look, I'll be the first to admit I'm a complete bastard. I'm also lazy. I'm only here to find the idiot. There's almost an idiot. This support group is pretty typical. We connected online, decided on a quiet place. Jerome takes the lead, pouring everyone a cup of tea as he starts talking. I'm Jerome. You can drink your tea, but only after explaining why you are here. I'll start. He tells us he's never been loved. I can see why. The guy's ugliest scene. He sips his tea while the mousy chick speaks next. Mew, she says, short and sweet. No blubbering. Gotta admire Mew. She's probably not the idiot. Next to talk are a legless veteran, a broken businessman, a needle track junkie, and a diseased old crone. Then it's my turn. I'm an ass. Everyone hates me. I take a loud, annoying slurp of Olang as the fat kid with the black eye goes next, telling his boring fat kid sub story. Afterward, we're all sitting quietly when Jerome kills over. Then Mew's eye roll back and she slumps forward. The fat kid said, I thought this was a suicide support group. Found the idiot. It is, I say, spitting out my mouth full of tea. They support it. No one wants to die alone, kid. Oh, how goes white he turns, looking into his cup. I love it. I never have to lift a finger. Told you I'm a lazy bastard. Five years ago, my mom started dating a guy she met on a dating site. That part is fine. I had recently started dating the woman who would later become my wife and we had met online. I'll just refer to her as my wife for a story. Anyway, my wife and I don't like this guy. We don't think he was men or anything like that. Just a boy. Just a creepy boy. He was quiet. He kept his eyes closed a lot and occasionally said odd things, like offering my wife a chocolate and then popping one in his mouth, closing his eyes and mounting as he let it melt in his mouth. One time, my wife and I were visiting my mom, but she got called into work, so we waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over, but he spent the entire several hours just hanging out in his bedroom, with the door closed. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy started having some difficulties. My wife and I were visiting my mom on holidays, and she dropped all of her problems on us, and we listened carefully. We suggested that she would be better off without him. She already had her mind made up, and decided to break up with him on Christmas. We spend the night at my mom's and get up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's, but we got snowed in, which was actually a nice Christmas surprise. The next day we left as soon as we could get through the snow, and my wife suggested that we stop by my mom's house on the way, so that we could see if she was okay. My wife just had a really bad feeling about my mom's ex. My mom's car was in the driveway, but it doesn't mean much, because she lives close enough to work that she often walks and it hadn't snowed in her town. She also never locks her door, which drives me crazy, so we let ourselves in. That's when we see blood oozing out. It had filled up the spell container and was leaking onto the floor and had made a puddle. My wife freaked out and I screamed. I expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. I nervously opened the freezer to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened, crammed into the freezer so that it fell onto the ice dispenser. I thought my mom was decapitated by her creepy ex-boyfriend. Four years ago, I lived in a large farmhouse that was converted into two apartments. The house was known as the old boys' home. It was used to house boys with some issues, but was closed due to allegations of molestation. Anyway, I was living with my boyfriend and two-year-old daughter at that time. My bedroom had a large fireplace that had been boarded up and painted over. I decided to push my bed up against it. One day, while I was rearranging things, it was like a headboard. That night, around 1am, I had heard a small voice saying, Mom, I had sat up in my bed, but didn't see anything, 
so I reached over my boyfriend trying to grab down to grab my daughter and put her in our bed. I kept feeling around and I was still hearing the voice, but I couldn't feel her. My boyfriend woke up and turned the beside lamp and asked me, what the hell are you doing? I explained that Emilia was trying to get in our bed and I was reaching for her. There was nobody there. My daughter was sound asleep in her room. Then the next night came. Around 1am, again my dog shouted, so my boyfriend got up to take him outside. You know the feeling in bed when someone lies down next to you, where the bed pushes in and there is a warmth in your back? I felt that, so I assumed my boyfriend had come back to bed. I rolled over, my boyfriend wasn't there. I felt the fucking bed release pressure, whatever was lying next to me has gotten up in the second. I moved my bed the next day to other side. I never had another incident in the two years I remained in that house. When I was 16, my growing family moved from the house I'd spent the entire life in. As you would expect, we spent a lot of time remembering things we used to do in the house as we were packing everything up. At some point, I decided to go into the downstairs closet with a flashlight, something I used to do when I was younger, to get some peace and quiet. Now, this is one of those deep closets that goes under the stairs. It went back around 8 feet. This place was occupied by the mountain of old blankets and stuffed animals. Of course, this is the most spot to sit and read. About an hour, I shift a little to get comfortable, and I heard a low voice say, You always make me happy. I flipped my shit, hit my head on ceiling, and practically broke the door down getting up. After explaining to my family why there was no color left on my face, I went back to see what it was. It was my stuffed little bit, from when I was four or five years old, that I happened to lean in just right to press his belly. When I was pressed the stomach again though, nothing. This poor bear I hadn't played with since I was a toddler used the less of its power. Its dying breath tell me I made it happy. You make me happy too little bit when you are not making me piss myself. I was with my brother home alone when we suddenly heard a creepy voice from the other room saying, come here, come here, I want to talk to you. We didn't know who or what it was and immediately ran upstairs. While we were running, we heard someone nearby say, Do you both think you can run from me? I see everything. At this point we were terrified, locking the door to our room, grabbing our mini baseball bats and crying. We were sure we were going to be killed or eaten by some monster. Then it happened. A loud bang came from the closet and a monster sprang up. We freaked out. My brother fell and I threw the bat at my dad wearing an IT clown mask and laughing at us. Turns out he was behind the whole thing. First, he had pulled all the cordless phones in the house on the speaker and said he was leaving to run some errands, hide in our closet and scare us. A few years ago, I went to a Christmas party. The night my housemates went home earlier while I decided to stay and get in the Christmas spirit with a few other friends. I ended up getting pretty hammered and got home around 2 a.m. Instead of going straight to bed, I got beer inside, then went down the back porch to have a smoke and look at the stars. I was outside a couple of minutes when I see the light go on in the kitchen. My housemate comes out and look at me out the back. I thought he was going to come out and get a debrief on the rest of the evening. As there were some good laughs, we had not relevant to this. He just gets the glass of water and goes to bed. I finish my smoke and beer and so do I. The next morning we are rehashing the previous night, when he mentions getting up and seeing me having a smoke out the back. Who came back from the party with you last night? I give him a sideways look and reply, no one bro, I was out there alone. He said, there was someone out there with you, behind you on the porch, when you were looking inside waving. I didn't come out cause I thought, it was some random friend from the Christmas party, couldn't be bothered making introductions. He stands by this version of events. Whoever it was must have been standing close behind me the whole time. I saw no one and heard nothing. Make me horrified when I think about it. I used to work inside of an old cotton mill. It had since been knocked down and turned into a retail park. There was 100 a pen in the ass ghost in our storeroom. I would load up a trolley with stock to go and put on the shop floor. And when I turned around, the entire trolley would be empty. I don't mean knocked over. I mean every item was back where I picked it up from. It would piss me off more than scare me. The ghost also used to peek around at us. 
there was a bit in the stock room where TV boxes were packed together with zero room between them, apart from one corridor in the middle. I would get a feeling of being watched. I turned around to look and would see a shadow dip back behind one of the TV boxes, like it was watching you and hiding when it got caught. It used to turn the lights off too, because it would always be when it was far from the switch. I would talk to it all the time, and if I'm having a bad day, just ask it to leave me alone. And it would. Can you believe it? My uncle used to have a typewriter in his house, but not any ink for it. I would sometimes tap on the keys and pretend I was writing a story, but get told love by my uncle. One day, while my grandmother was sick in the hospital, there was something strange written on the typewriter. It said, 15 months, in dark red ink. I checked to see if the typewriter had any ink left, but it didn't. I took the paper out and threw it away, since I was 10 at the time and thought it was a joke. That's how long my grandmother was alive for, 15 months. Sometimes, I see my name written on it. My uncle, aunts, and cousins don't remember. I think it was from when I used to play with. One night, a young man was walking on the desolate road to go to another village. Hearing a shot from behind, his feet stopped. My child, listen, just go ahead carefully. When the young man turning, he saw an old man. In confusion, young man asked, but why? The old man replied, You don't know. Some teenagers murdered one trade passer. Hearing this, the young man asked in surprise, Killed a trade passer? The old man said, That soul is a stop youngster passing through the road. After talking about this incident, his soul kills the trade passer and then buried his dead body under the tree. The young man asked with great surprise, How do you know about all this? Seeing a bitter smile on the old man's face. Now, the young man's legs were shaking up. 